Hello and welcome to CBC Arts Exhibitionist, the only TV show that takes you on a 30-minute cross-country tour of Canadian art. Today we're at The Rooms, the art destination in the heart of St. John's. The design of this building, which you have to climb a super steep hill to get to, mirrors the traditional fishing rooms where families would come together with the day's catch. But today, we're here with catch of a different kind, art. On today's episode, we take a fantastical bike ride through Toronto. We see how skateboards can become a symbol of decolonization. We explore how traditional Chinese ceramics are mixed with future technologies. And we ponder mortality in the most mesmerizing of environments. I hope you're ready because I am. I'm Amanda Paris and this is CBC Arts Exhibitionist. I think when you're a child, it's so easy and encouraged to just pursue your enthusiasm and whether that be dance or drawing or theater or whatever and then you get to the certain age and the certain point where there's so much pressure to just only pursue skills that will in some way advance your career um, or be for profit and I think drawing has been one of the few things that I've been able to kind of keep sacred and and be able to go back to that state of play. I've never really tried to brand it. I've never really tried to choose a color palette uh, or like a definite style even. It's just been this thing that's very impulsive and, and fun. Like it's kind of when music turns on, you dance. Like I, drawing has just always been innate. Biking is the only time in my day where I'm not listening. <laughs> to podcasts or music or people. It's the only time where I'm able to just listen to the sounds of the city and go where I'm going. And, I, and I've never really thought of it that way, but I think I really need that time in my day to not be kind of bombarded with, with news information. and information and, and opinions. So I think when I was first on social media, uh, a lot of my content was so curated and perfect that it was already kind of a, a fantasy version of my life. And once I, I sort of realized that it was not realism anyway, uh, I kind of took it a step further and started adding actual ele elements of my imagination into the scene. So that was sort of the origin of this drawing collection. When do you know if you're good enough, you know? Or like if your ideas are interesting. Yeah. Is that all confidence? Like is what you, is what makes you different, different from like all the rest of the group, just like you being like my ideas, my images are um, worth it mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. your like, I don't know. Or not even rather than yours, but like mine are just yeah, as good as good. everyone else's. That's interesting because I feel like if I were to see your work online, it wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, Deepa's going through confidence. Yeah. It would be more like, oh, Deepa's like, being really generous and sharing something that means oh, a lot sure. to her. Because so many people have art Instagrams, it's not this like high, it's not only the, the professional illustrators that, have, right. that put it online. You don't have to go to art school. You don't have to have a mm -hmm. grand mission behind it. Like people can really like your doodle of like, a girl with a bunch of armpit hair, like that's, <laughs> that'll be, yeah. Yeah. um, reassuring. I also recently did a travel journal and that was, uh, came pretty naturally because I think when you're in a new space, it's, uh, it's easy to find inspiration. I just find it a lot easier to remember how I felt in a moment through drawing. Once you spend a long time looking at a specific object or space, you, you end up feeling connected to it. And in a weird way, drawing the CN Tower as a UFO and these uh, 
like flying creatures outside of my bus stop has, I think, uh, made me feel like Toronto is more of my city and made me feel a lot more connected to the space. We head now from Toronto to Vancouver's Chinatown. How are you? Good, how's it going? <laughs> Glad to see you. Nice to see you. Oh, your eyebrows look good. Yeah, I got it done yesterday. It's super dark now. I hope yeah. it's not super weird. I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> so I have all this. Uh, this guy, tree, okay. and I have... That is really cool. I like that one a lot, actually. Yeah. 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 I'm E. Stropke, a tattoo artist based in Vancouver, BC. I, I consider myself as a, a more introverted person. Art making is, is a way for me to communicate with people. I don't want to give away too much just enough to, to let the audience to, to accept or love characters or things they don't fully understand. I was born and raised in China. I always took the more traditional realistic drawing classes. That was a common thing. When I was in high school, me and a few friends got the books about contemporary art. And those books opened up a whole new world to us. I think that was the starting point. We're young, we, we, we're looking for something that's different. <laughs> One of my friends uh, had a space, kind of like a gallery space, doing exhibitions with artists who had a, some political opinions that was not allowed at that time. He had to close that gallery space. That's actually the first time I experienced censorship uh, so closely that definitely had an, an influence on how I value freedom of speech, freedom of expressions. I've been working in black medicine tattoo for uh, roughly two years. At first, I was just tattooing on my friends. I was very nervous because I was leaving a permanent mark on someone, but fortunately, all my friends are very encouraging. I, I was looking for, for a job, so I started to take clients from the internet. I often got asked the question, like, what's the meaning behind those tattoos? I think we don't really need to ask. Like, people don't visually like things randomly. If it's aesthetically pleasing to you, it probably has a meaning already. Coming up, we check out the exhibit bringing skateboarders from the streets to the gallery. Border X is a traveling art show that arrived in St. John's with a ton of art and a custom-built halfpipe. It features work from indigenous artists across the country who snowboard, skateboard, and surf. I'm about to talk with Darren Duell, the curator of Canadian art here at The Rooms, to learn more about the way this exhibit has become an act of institutional decolonization. Hi, Darren. Hello. It's nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you, too. Yeah. So tell me about this show and how it came to be. The exhibition overall is uh, an exhibition featuring contemporary artwork by artists from Indigenous nations. And they use these board practices as vehicles to challenge the status quo, challenge conformity, but as well as demonstrate a knowledge and a lived experience with the land and the environment. Cool. Well, I am very interested to see how all of this manifests in the art itself. So could we take a look around? For sure. Let's okay, go. Great. Okay, well, I've seen these many times on the internet, but this is the first time I'm seeing it in real life. Can you tell me about this work? These skateboards are made by uh, Michael Langan, who runs a, a company called Colonialism Skateboards. 
And Colonialism Skateboard's whole mission is to help educate or at least expose people to some of the darker moments of Canadian history, some of the, the realities of Indigenous people and Indigenous nations and, and some of the things that they've endured. I mean, it's such a jarring thing to see something that you consider fun, like a skateboard or light or recreational, combined with these kind of images. Yeah, I think it's really smart by Michael Langan and Kent Monkman to, to be able to do that. You see it, it's bright, it's colorful, you might, from a distance it might look fun, and then you get here and realize what you're looking at, yeah. and I think that's, um, Canada's history. That's a really important thing that we can't turn away from. We have to confront those images and think about what it means and how we each relate to them as people in this country. Yeah. So can you tell me about this work here? For sure, right now we're sitting in Jordan Bennett's installation called The Basket Ladies. It features a digital projection on the wall and a custom longboard that Jordan has actually etched. That one over there. Embedded. Yes, right yeah. here behind us. In the video, uh, Jordan actually shows some conversations that he had with his auntie and his uncle uh, talking about the basket ladies, about traditional Mi'kmaq basket weaving, the techniques, the practices, the materials. Oh, no. She gave me one basket at the moment, and I said to her, I said, who made that? She said, I made it. And now she's talking, funny, I made it. I said, it's only easy, she said. You just take it, and she was telling me what to do. And so then how does he then take those learnings and those teachings that he got from his aunt and his uncle and incorporate it into board culture and, or his, his artwork with boards? He did provide us with one clue, and the longboard behind us, again, uh, has a series of engravings on it, which he's uh, rubbed in with some ink to help show the lines. And they embed Mi'kmaq and epistem epistemologies, cosmologies, uh, and different references, ge geographical references, um, that are significant to him, that he distilled from his conversations with his family. And yeah, so we see uh, Jordan Bennett here skateboarding, uh, using his longboard to uh, propel himself forward and navigate through the land. And the longboard that he's actually riding in the video is literally the one on the wall behind us. You can actually see there's still a bit of, uh, you know, dirt and discoloration on the wheels. Like, it is a real right. gritty board that was out in the world, uh, which I think is interesting thinking about this low art and high art collision, uh, that it is, you know, it was ridden out on the streets and it collected dirt. It has this debris and it has this material history. Um, that again, you might not expect to find in a contemporary art gallery where everything's supposed to be pristine and clean. Right. And it wasn't just made for this space, it was made for something else as well too. And it's kind of being loaned here for this moment. That's right, yeah. yeah. Things like skateboarding, snowboarding, surfing, they aren't topics galleries are usually grappling with. How has this exhibit transformed the rooms and transformed the space of the rooms? Having an exhibition like this and doing the things that we did for the opening provides a space, provides a rationale, but really actually forces the institution to rethink what it is, mm -hmm. how it functions, how it relates to communities. And I think that having a, an opportunity like Border X where all those rules can be not just broken, but actually rewritten so that we can carry this energy and carry this new perspective of ourselves forward, so that it isn't just a one-off event. Well, thank you so much, Darren, for taking the time to speak with me. That is an incredible exhibit, and it's been so exciting to be here at The Rooms. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> now we go from decolonizing skateboards to remixing Chinese pottery. My name is Brendan Lee Satesh Tang, and I'm a visual artist based in Vancouver. I think a lot of my work is kind of mashups or remixes of different things. Exploring those feelings of hybridity or dualism or multiple sort of experiences all happening at once. I like to tap into popular culture. I like to tap into historical references. For instance, the Mango Ormolu work, you have the very futuristic elements that kind of play with those ideas of the utopian future. 
And then I have the traditional Chinese blue and white forms. And so the object becomes this remix or a hybrid of having one foot in the past and then one foot in the future. I always gravitate towards sort of in-between spaces. I grew up in an immigrant family, and then living in Vancouver, which is also a really hybrid town, one could look at that as being autobiographical in nature. Currently, I'm an artist in resident at the Burrard Art Foundation here in Vancouver, and I'm taking this opportunity to work outside of the material that I've been working in, which has been clay. I'm working on this series of cloud sculptures uh, made out of wood. The initial inspiration for the work that I'm doing now uh, came very much out of doing the work with the Mango Ormolu series and painting the Chinese clouds that appear in a lot of the blue and white patterns. As I was working with them, they started becoming more and more like low polygon renderings of these clouds and they started being reminiscent of old video games that I had played. So the cloud forms that I'm making here uh, almost become a metaphor or an icon for our digital lives. They become a stand-in for the lives that we live online versus the lives that we live outside of the internet. I'm interested in creating a space where the viewer kind of walks into that cloud that we're uploading all our information to and see what it looks like sculpturally. When I'm working with my hands, I'm also figuring out the ideas, like my brain is firing off in different ways. The work just continues to kind of unfold and explain itself to me. Coming up, we meet the artist who created a secular chapel of suspended orbs. When you're drawing and you get into a pattern and it becomes repetitive, you go into a flow state, like concentrating on, on the movement and the motion. And what it does is it frees up your mind. I knew that I needed the time and space to just sit and think. So doing work that was repetitive, but also very like time consuming and detailed gave me that space. It's how I kind of work out my ideas, I guess. My name is Philippa Jones, and I work in interactive art, new media, and the intersection between games and natural history. When I first came to Newfoundland, I worked primarily in interactive projections, um, but I came over with just a suitcase, and I had to leave all my art supplies behind. So I used the, what I could to start uh, making art, which was drawing because it was uh, cheap <laughs> and didn't take up much space. So um, I started drawing and just letting my drawings kind of evolve and see what would happen. Drawing then became sort of the real center focus then for the rest of my practice. The natural world has always been something I have been drawn to and focused on. As a kid, I would spend all my time wandering around in the fields by myself and collecting things from nature. I've always been interested in mortality. I think part of that comes from a connection with nature. Um, you see death then in the animal world and in the cycles of life around you. The hairs are somewhere between life and death. The crystals are exploding out of them in a way to convey uh, what's gonna be happening next. So you can see all space and time compressed into, into one moment. Recently, I've lost a loved one and I felt like when that person died, it wasn't their immortality that I found. I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe their death. While on the one hand, I totally knew it, 
there was no denying it. On the other, it felt impossible that their life force and energy and this person who'd been so alive and vibrant one minute could be gone the next. When looking at mortality and maybe the space between life and death, the bird feels like the perfect animal to kind of encapsulate that, I guess. I've been thinking about how in a more secular age, we don't have spaces that the churches once offered where we get to contemplate the bigger questions about life and death beyond our own immediate experience, which can seem kind of overwhelming and crushing. So the orbs almost create like a secular space of wonder where you get to contemplate these bigger ideas, but you can do so slightly outside of yourself. You can see it in a connection to a bigger picture and then with more of a sense of wonder and awe about everything rather than perhaps fear. I liked how that on the one hand, the act of preservation makes something eternal. They're like the bugs you find in amber that's been preserved for hundreds of thousands of years. This whole piece, I wanted to, to convey that sense of timelessness, um, but also perhaps a sense of potential. Um, and especially in an exhibition like this, which is somewhat morbid and a little macabre, um, I was concerned that people's takeaway would be a, a depressing one, I guess. And really what I wanted people to feel when they left was uplifted and more that through their understanding of their own mortality, they would seize life, I guess, and feel more life affirmed. If there's an artist you think should be on CBC Arts Exhibitionist, send me a message on social media. Our handle is at CBC Arts. Tune in next week for another deep dive into the invigorating work of Canadian artists. I'm gonna go explore St. John some more, but I won't be kissing any fish. Peace.